prepare that, and then we can go from there. Um, the second or the third option is to adopt a more comprehensive program that's more proactive, where you adopt a local road use and preservation law that will fairly allocate the costs amongst the developers that are using the road and causing the damage or requiring upgrades to be done and the municipality and its obligation to maintain those roads. And what we try to do is talk to towns about a variety of options. And later we're going to get to a slide that talks about what are the kinds of things you need to think about in a program um, and, dis and questions you should be asking yourself when you're establishing it. One thing is, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's no one right answer. There's different issues that are important to different towns. There's different types of traffic that some towns find more problematic. There's different issues and types of traffic that other towns do not have a, that kind of problem with. So you, you want to go through and make sure you're, you're tailoring your program for your own situation, your own road network, and the type of usage that you're anticipating. And you also want to stay within the parameters of the law that is set out for you to do all these things. Okay, the authority to regulate roads comes from many different sources. Most basic are from the New York State Constitution and the Municipal Home Rule Law, which give you the power to adopt local laws to the acquisition care, management, and use of highways, roads, streets, avenues, and property. Now again, that's all limited by the requirement that it not be inconsistent, those local laws not be inconsistent with laws of general applicability. The New York State Vehicle and Traffic Law gives you the ability to regulate roads by controlling the traffic and having different issues and different requirements and limitations you can pr place on the traffic. Um, there's limitations. Now, there's a lot of discussion of having permits be issued. And I caution you that the, the idea of a permit makes perfect sense. However, you have to be very careful in de dealing with permits under the VTL. And we'll get to that restriction in a little bit. The municipal home rule law helps give you the authority to adopt laws that can help you recapture damages for, to the roads. The, even the gas drilling statute, environmental conservation law section 23-0303 has an exemption that says local, law, local towns have exempt, uh, exclusive jurisdiction over local roads. And it's not subject to the preemption of the state for that type of operation. And also, because we're not, I know gas drilling is the, the main issue that people are concerned about with traffic, but there's a lot of other development projects out there that could create traffic that you might want to regulate. So when, you're, when there's a seeker review, if a, town, if a project is in your town and they're analyzing traffic as part of their seeker review for a site plan review or for a special use permit, then you could look at it and say, okay, under that seeker analysis, what are the impacts of the traffic that's going to occur and what do we do about it? What are, the, what are the impacts? What are the mitigation measures that we're going to put in place? How do we enforce it? And all of those kinds of things. So that's another tool. Now, from a local context, that won't work with gas drilling because the seeker analysis is done by DEC. So it's a different animal altogether, but that's just one avenue you can take. The vehicle and traffic law generally is there to make sure that there's free flow of traffic for the general public, to make sure that municipalities have all the, they, the general rule is you have to allow the free flow of traffic. You can't charge people to use the roads. You can't create licenses, permits, and things like that that allow the use of your roads or collect fees for the use of your roads. There are exceptions, though, where they, they create a laundry list of things in Section 1660, which I know Mike went into in greater detail where there's certain powers that are given to you. Um, Mike talked about all the specific ones. And this one here, the ability to adopt other reasonable local laws and ordinances is often relied upon um, to try to get around some of the requirements or limitations contained in the VTL. Well, the problem is with that is that they have to be, again, consistent with what's in the VTL. So you can't really undo what the VTL is telling you uh, you can do. So, the, and that's where a permitting system or certain um, weight classifications and things like that can be problematic. There's ways of dealing with that and not every, you know, they're not all a uh, problem, but that's an issue. That's where your authority will come from, but you have to be mindful of the limitations that it has. Deficiencies with the program is uh, the VTL powers and limitations as we see it are that the VTL does not address responsibility for costs arising from damage caused by a project from develop, private development. Now, that 
also it doesn't uh, it doesn't address the impacts to roads from repeated use of the roads by lo legal loads and you know with the VTL does give you the authority to go and say if a truck is over width, overweight, or over you know, outside the dimensions that are allowed, to regulate those and, and capture those. And that's really been a trigger for a lot of the wind development projects that have gone on because the turbines are so large that they use that as an authority to go in. However, um, a lot of other types of construction activity don't fall under that umbrella. You have water trucks, you have concrete trucks, you have gravel trucks dump trucks carrying dirt and waste and things away. All of those are legal loads. So how do you then get to them is the question that, that it comes up. Now, there's Mike talked about this case that was decided in December where there's a limitate, you know, a lot of towns were establishing uh, truck route, or like to establish truck routes through their town in order to keep traffic out of certain areas. In this particular case, there was a, uh, I think it was a dairy plant, a cheese plant, Sorrento cheese plant that was involved and there was a lot of trucks going through the, the city of Lackawanna on a state route that was going delivering product and taking product away, and it was creating quite a lot of traffic in the city no longer wanted to have it in that particular area. So they established truck routes, and it went up to the appellate division, and the appellate division said, no, there's a, there's a limitation on your ability to create truck routes, which is that you have to provide access to state highways. So you, you can't, in this particular case, the road went right through the city, they blocked off the road where it came in and then where, where it came in on both sides of the city, so they couldn't have access to that state road, and they had to find another way around. And the court said, you can't do that. That, that limitation of providing access to state highways is to be read across the board on all of the limitations and powers that are given in the VTL. So it's an important case. It'll be interesting to see if it go, it's taken up by the Court of Appeals, because it can have some significant ramifications on a municipality's powers in light of uh, upcoming development if it ever occurs. All right, the question then becomes, who pays for the highway repairs? Municipalities, as you all well know, bear the burden to do that. You have a budget, you raise taxes, you fix your highways and you keep it going that way. You may get state aid or federal money to help you do some certain things, but basically it's your responsibility. Again, the VTL is there to provide free access of roads and that's what it's generally intended to do. You have comprehensive rules for budgeting and funding for ro local improvements. And there's a case we'll talk about a little later called the Association of Builders, which challenged regulations in the town of Gilderland several years ago. In that case, the town of Gilderland, where Crossgates Mall is, saw a tremendous amount of development going around. And they said, you know, all this development is putting more and more traffic on our roads, and it's creating a greater maintenance obligation and repair obligations on the part of our town so if from now on, if you come in as a developer, you're going to have to pay a fee based on the square footage of your development or the number of housing units you're going to develop, and that's going to go into our funds, and we're going to use that money to, to make road improvements. And the court, it went all the way up to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals said that's impermissible. The VTL prevents you and precludes you from being able to impose any of those kinds of fees for the use of the roads. Now, under a seeker review, you could say, you know, there's impacts to traffic. You have to fully analyze them. You have to mitigate those things. That's all well and good. This was on top of that and really wasn't related to any impacts. And the money that was going to be used, import, the important part was the money that was brought in wasn't going to necessarily be used to fix the problems that project caused. It might be something else that was caused by another project or just a road had been in bad shape or historically flooded or whatever it might be, and you're going to take that money and then go fix the problem. And the court said, no, you can't do that. Okay, so how do we get... Yes, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, it's on. Yep. So how was that ever resolved? Because they were apparently seeing a lot of wear on their roads, and it was going to, going to really increase the, their road maintenance costs, and, uh, and they weren't able to re retrieve the revenues they wanted from the developers. So how was it resolved? Well, basically, the, the, bi the best tool would be through your seeker analysis, okay? And in that case, the developers had to go to the town of Gilderland to get permits, whether it be special use permits, site plan, or otherwise. And they had to go there and get their permits, and they had to have, identify their traffic impacts, identify their mitigation measures. 
Now, a standard traffic analysis in Seeker is let's look at the intersections that are where the traffic's coming to your project, how it flows to your project. What is the, they look at the timing of that traffic. They look at intersections where there's traffic signals or stop signs. And they look at how many cars stack up. They call that queuing. They look at um, the timing of the traffic lights. How long are you waiting at that traffic light? And they look at those types of elements to determine what type of improvements to the road or the signals or otherwise are needed. They might say you need to add a turning lane. They might see, say, well, that entrance should be right in, right out only so you don't have traffic being held up and direct traffic in different directions. That analysis needs to, I think, there, that analysis needs to be expanded to look at, okay, this is creating that level, that extra level of traffic. What is that doing to the physical condition of the roads? And that question I don't think was ever addressed in the review of those projects. So I think ultimately the developer lost, or the, the town lost and went and tried to, you know, find a, another way. But that's, if I was advising them what to do, that's the type of analysis I think that I would include, tell them to include in their review of a project so that they can uh, you know, then capture that element of, well, what is that traffic damage going to do? Is it going to shorten the life of my road? Is it going to create obligation to resurface or whatever it might be? Yes, sir. If, if the impact fee was used for the impacts caused by that development, would the result have been different? Not under, the, the, the court's analysis was basically, they looked at it and they found that that was one element that was an, it was an important element, but that was one element of the program that they didn't like. What they were basically saying is, you know, you can impact your, your under seeker, you can look at what is done. This was a, an, an add-on fee that was not related to the impact that was going to be caused. It was related to the size of the development blanket in a blanket way. So there were several elements within there that, that, um, that the court didn't like. So, what we've tried to advise clients and working with Delta, what we've tried to do is advise clients to look at it as what are you trying to protect? What is your goal to do? What is your aim? What is your goal with your roads? Is it timing of traffic? Is it safety? Is it condition of the road surface, the road base? And I look at it holistically that way so then you can identify what you're trying to capture and adequately and accurately address those issues. Yes, sir. If you've um, right touched on this before, I apologize, mm -hmm. but what about an instance where none of the permitting is done in your town, none of the development is done in your town, but the traffic is as equally increased mm -hmm. sure. as in the towns that, that did the permitting? Well, there's, there's a couple issues there that, you, and one, we'll touch on it a little bit in a little later. In the context of for, we'll use gas drilling as an example, or even wind farm development. But basically where you have a lot of trucks passing through, that is a tremendous concern for many towns. Because a lot of towns say, well, you know what, either I've adopted a ban, or I have a moratorium, or just the, the conditions are such that we're not likely to see drilling here, but we could see traffic associated with drilling go through our towns. So the idea and the way to capture that is to look at your, what are you trying to regulate? It's the nature of the traffic, and how do you quantify that traffic, and how do you separate that traffic from what normally occurs on your roads, which you wouldn't regulate. So what we've been, been able to do is work with some towns and to create some jurisdictional triggers, one of which is construction activity, which is construction activity is a defined term, and we're kind of jumping ahead, but that's okay. Construction activity is a defined term, which basically says if you're getting a permit from a state, local, or federal agency, to do an activity, and you have a certain type of traffic associated with that activity, what we call concentrated traffic, some people call it high impact, high volume traffic, that you have this type of traffic, then those two things together, it, it's not dependent upon the location of that construction activity, it's the nature of the traffic that's associated with it. Now that hasn't been tested in court, but we feel very confident that that, that regulating the traffic in that particular manner and saying it's the nature of the traffic, the volume of the traffic, and we have an engineering basis upon which to distinguish it from what happens normally gives us the ability to capture that traffic. The way you get to that traffic is to have a program in place, and we recommend with a local law, that sets forth standards and requirement to give people passing through notice that this can occur. 
And so it's, that's, that's basically how we would do it and create that, that program that says, if you are, have traffic associated with a regulated construction activity, whether or not it's in our town, you're using our roads, then you're subject to our law. Now, the, the practical issue with that, and, and, and this is typical, is that's a very big concern for many towns. Our experience with these types of projects is the developers will go out of their way to not use town roads in those instances because that's an additional cost they may need to incur in order to get where they need to go. Now, it happens because individual drivers or companies that are hauling things make decisions to use roads because the other, they don't like going the other way or there's a pothole or whatever it might be. Um, but generally, in our experience with the equipment and those things, they stay on state and county roads as long as possible and then use the local roads only to get to their very destination. Um, there's going to be certain instances where that situation they can't avoid. They have to go on town roads to get where they're going to go. And then you want to make sure that you're, you're protected in that regard. Okay. Um, we've talked about a little bit, I touched on that developers often recognize that they need help. They need, your roads need help. They need to use them. And they come to you seeking permission to do that. And oftentimes they'll come to you with generally a, a reasonably fair, but maybe not totally comprehensive agreement. Um, basically, the, the tenant is, let's look at the roads, we'll tell you what we're going to do to the roads to accommodate our traffic, and we'll make sure that we fix the roads and repair the surface before we leave. And those are generally how they do it, and there's some insurance and indemnity provisions in there. But, you know, again, looking at it and from a larger perspective, looking at a, a variety of issues, there's more to be included often than just those limited issues in a road use agreement. We've talked about, you know, there's been, obviously, gas drilling is a major concern and a major uh, source of potential damage for roads. Wind energy development, pipeline construction, whether it be for gas or water, can be also create, you know, limp, those types of impacts um, that you want to be concerned about. Large-scale commercial and industrial developments, even recreational attractions or events, you know, those are more of a commercial nature. But there's all kinds of projects out there that when something needs, large needs to be constructed or there's a short period of time, think of the Woodstock concert. Think of all that traffic that went in. That might not be large, heavy truckloads, but it's a tremendous strain on the transportation system. And you, meet, you need to look at it. Maybe that's not a structural issue for the road, but it could be damage to, you know, damage, other unintended damages caused by the use of the roads for that event. So there's a lot of different events out there in addition to gas drilling where road preservation programs can be important. All right, local roads, as everyone who follows the gas drilling industry and the, and the progress of the DEC's work, the big legal battles that occurred in Dryden and Middlefield, the big debate was how far and what is the scope of preemption of the state statutes over municipalities re relative to gas drilling. Well, the one thing that was never in question was the ability of local governments to regulate its own roads. It's specifically excluded from the, from the preemption, and that gives us a very strong basis to look at what we can do for our roads in the context of gas drilling. And again, in, a, in connection with our work with a variety of towns, particularly in Sul Sullivan County, we worked with Delta to put together a, a uh, generic environmental impact statement that dealt with road preservation and uh, the establishment of programs in all of these towns to, to uh, protect their roads in the, uh, in the face of drilling and other projects. So the, what the towns were successful in doing is contacting DEC as they were preparing the supplemental GEIS and saying, we want you to know we're looking at all these issues. We want you to make it, you, you aware of some of the ideas and concerns and mitigation measures that we are looking at and delivered them a set of comments with all that in it. And very fortunately, the DEC incorporated most of those comments into their, their mitigation measures in the section of the GEIS relative to, to, to local roads. So there's a, you know, that, that consistency that's there and looking at those issues gives a lot of backbone to the, to the work that's being done on the local level to say that it's been, you know, included in the state GEIS. Now, it's not final yet. It could be changed. We don't know. But having that in there is a very good basis and to show that 
the, this issue of local roads and the structure of the roads is very important. With regards to gas drilling, this is just a quick summary. I'm sure all of you are probably as aware as I am, if not more so, about the status. What we're looking at is they're still looking at comments. The DEC is still looking at comments that were received, over 60,000 comments on, the, on its supplemental GEIS. Um, we, we had a discussion, a, a presentation from the DEC commissioner at our office about a month and a half ago. He's ho he was hopeful that those comments in the final GEIS would be completed by the end of the year. Uh, we haven't heard anything di different at this point, but uh, we'll wait and see. Um, once the, the, f the final GEIS is done, there needs to be a finding statement and then the final regulations to be adopted. Whether that all happens at the end of 2012 or bleeds over into 2013 remains to be seen. The first drilling permits can't be issued until all of that is completed, and they can't even review the applications until all of that is completed. So what's going to happen is that when they're finished, they'll receive the applications. This also doesn't take into account the likelihood of litigation that could occur that could further delay that from occurring. What that does, in our opinion, is it gives municipalities an opportunity right now to look at and be proactive. What do we do in, with the likelihood if this is going to come? How do we act? What, what are the appropriate steps for us to take? This is just a photo showing you the, the concentrated truck, truck traffic at a well site while it's being fracked. And it gives you an idea of the scope and the magnitude that occurs. And this is, you know, will continue over and over until the fracking is completed. Once the fracking is completed and the well is operational, the traffic goes way down. But as you can see, in a short period of time, there can be a substantial amount of traffic. So why establish a, you know, a, a program in the, in the face of gas drilling? Lots and lots of truck trips, heavy truck trips in a short amount of time on roads that are not prepared for that eventuality. They weren't designed to handle that kind of traffic, and they can be damaged. The other side of the coin is if they're upgraded and they're made to accommodate that kind of traffic, there's issues associated with that. It's not what your residents are used to. It's a different kind of traffic. The speeds can be different. The, the turning uh, and, and the dim geometrical dimensions of the roads can be different. And all, it can affect the way what happens when I come out of my driveway. I've lived there for 30 years that I back out and there's never anyone there. Now I back out and there's five water trailers going by. I need to be careful of what can happen. So there's all kinds of issues there on the table that want to give you the ability to, to have a handle on those issues that are presented to your town. Again, and the other element is that to give you the, the, an idea of the scope, in Pennsylvania, over $200 million in one year had been spent on road improvements and repairs. And that was mainly done during construction to keep their roads open and passable and get them, you know, get them up to where they needed to be and then keep them open and passable during the process. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with, okay, now we're done with this. What do we do with the improvements we did? What is the, the longevity of the improvements we did? What are the, you know, what is this going to mean for the town that has to maintain and deal with this road for the, for the remainder of its useful life? As we discussed, we've, we were working with a lot of wind development in both northern and western New York. And the, the interesting thing about a wind development is it usually has, it involves a large area of the town. It could be half the town, it can be the entire town, depending on the nature of these, of these projects. And they only use specific points within there, but it, the traffic has to circulate through in order to support that construction. Now, there's a huge number of trucks from, of every type that go through, from the very, very large oversized trucks hauling the turbine components, to gravel trucks, to cement trucks, to pickup trucks, to other trucks delivering cranes and equipment and things of that nature. There's a, a laundry list of things that there's a massive dissension of traffic on a town for a limited period of time. And so the, one of the things the developers knew going in is we are bringing this level of traffic in. These roads can't handle it. What do we do? We want to make sure that, one, the towns don't stop us from doing the construction, and two, that our, we're protecting our assets and when we go forward. The solution that they came up with was to enter into road use agreements for with each municipality where they were doing development. And, and then also on the state and county levels as well, because they use the whole road network. But for the municipalities, what they generally did is uh, throughout the review of the project, when the, the traffic impacts were being analyzed, one of the things they looked at was not so much 
traffic lights and the timing and things like that like we discussed in the Gilderling case, but more of what changes are you going to make to our road? Are you going to be repaving it? Are you going to be putting a new base in? Are you going to be changing the turning radius at the, at the intersections? What are the things you're going to try to do? Who's going to be in charge of it? Who's going to monitor it? And who's going to pay for it? So what they basically did is came up and said, your town, your experts are familiar with our project because they just reviewed it for you um, in the seeker review so we can get our permits. So what, we sugge what they suggested was, we will pay for those, div those engineers or any other engineer that you choose to stay on board and monitor what we do. And we will take them through the project and show them that we're meeting the standards of this road use agreement. They can report back to you with, it, with what we're doing. If you have concerns or questions, that gives a, an avenue of communication with us so we can address problems be before they become bigger and impact the, their ability to develop the project. So the, the basic pieces of it were that the consultants were hired and retained by the towns, so they owed their duty of, of loyalty to them. They were paid for by the developers through an escrow agreement. So there was no direct payment from the developer to the consultant. Um, the towns, the, any repairs to the roads that were identified by either the developers or the town were, were performed at the cost and expense of the developers. And there was also security and bonding put in place to make sure the developers performed and give the town some assurances that if they did not perform, there was a means for the town to capture funds to make that repair. The keys to, to the success and, and really were the municipalities having some oversight and involvement in the construction of the project and seeing what was going on and not waiting, getting knocks on the door or calls or emails from their constituents saying, we have a big problem here. And that by avoiding that, they were very effective in, in getting that taken care of. And the fact that there was security put up to let, if there was a dispute, that it was done. And also the towns, the towns also had authority to issue stop work orders under the terms of their permits. So if the roads were being damaged and the, and the developer was not paying attention to the requests of the town to fix those, they could issue a stop work order and get the attention of the developer to take care of that. That's a very drastic step to take because these are very large construction projects. Uh, Timetables are very important, and there's a lot of money on the line in terms of financing and things of that nature. So when the town issued a stop work order, it got the, the attention of the developers very quickly, but it was not an efficient way to do it. Uh, you, can, you know, that's kind of you know, using a hand grenade you know, to, when, you, when you could use a toothpick. Um, so it's, it's that kind of thing where you, know, you need a better, a better set of tools in order to effectively implement a program of that nature. Okay, the goals of a program. This is kind of where we're going to start talking about a little bit more of the, the larger aspect of, of what kind of programs you want to have. Basically, the number one goal of most municipalities is to protect the safety of its residents and travelers. They want the roads to be passable. They don't want anybody getting hurt. The next is to avoid or minimize adverse impact and damage to the local roads from this traffic. That's mainly a fiscal issue that's being driven in that if you're going to use our roads, we don't want to be on the hook for the costs of damage that you're ca causing us, because then we have to pass that through to our taxpayers, which isn't good for anybody. So that's an important piece. That, and then also, because it's a matter of fairness. If you're using the roads and you're damaging the roads, you should be responsible for fixing them. And it's basically what they try to do then is, is take these basic steps and say, we want haul routes identified. We want involvement in, in, in evaluating and identifying those haul routes. We want to understand what upgrades you're going to take for, to accommodate that traffic and make sure that they're done ahead of time so that the, there's not a dangerous condition created. And then also you want to make sure you're not necessarily levying taxes or imposing fees in, as a part of this program. You can have an application fee if it takes, if you had a, the, the highway superintendent has an assistant that maybe needs to handle all these permits and there's a cost involved in that, well, you can have an application fee that reasonably collects that or covers that application fee. Just as if someone applies for a site plan application, they can pay $100 or whatever the fee may be. It has to be reasonable in light of the work that's going to be performed, but it's not going to be, well, I'm going to charge you a per mile basis 
you know, you can't do that. It has to be something reasonable tied to the administrative costs. So program considerations, what, this is a really important, this is the meat of what we want to talk about right here. And, and Delta's program is, does a very good job, and there's other programs out there, but Delta's program does a very good job of working with towns to identify and these questions and answer them. Number one, what is the aim of your program? What type of traffic are you trying to capture? Do you want everything? Do you want to capture every bit of traffic, including normal traffic? Or do you want to just capture traffic that's associated with certain types of activities? And I think given where we all are in the discussion at this point, that's the nature of where everyone's going to the point where you have uh, a, a program that's aimed and identified at certain types of traffic that is most likely to cause damage to your roads, leaving the general public free to travel on the roads outside of this program, but you have protection in there. You want to adopt an approach to deal with developers, okay? What is the nature of the relationship you're going to be? Is it going to be a voluntary agreement? Is it going to be a mandatory agreement? Is it going to be a permit? What is it? And you want to look through the different options, and we'll get into each of these in a little more depth, but you want to look at the different options and what the costs are to the town in administering these programs and what the, the effectiveness and the, and the likely response from a developer is going to be. Understand your program triggers. And that goes to your question generally of how, if they're passing through my town, how do I capture this traffic? And you want to understand and you want it to be clear for you and clear for the regulated person or company to understand what the jurisdictional triggers are. And the programs that we've been working with focus on the nature of the activity. Is it a construction activity that requires a permit from a local, state, or federal agency? That's part one of this, the analysis. Part two is, does it create the kind of concentrated traffic that we're concerned about because that concentrated traffic will, have, will cause damage far different than the general public to the roads that, it's gonna, that they're going to follow? In answering these questions, it's often that you're going to need, need or want legal or engineering help. Not many towns have an in-house capability of doing that kind of engineering analysis. It might be a, a town engineer that helps the planning board or the highway department that's on board or another third party that has you know, expertise in this area, um, but, you know, or a town attorney or another attorney. But there's going to be engineering and legal issues that need to be addressed in establishing a program. You want to understand how am I going to address those, how am I going to deal with the costs of those, and what's, what are my options in each of, that, each of those arenas. You want to have procedures to administer the program. Once you have a program in place, developers will generally follow it as long as it's clear what's expected of them and what your obligations are. Go, having things be very vague and open isn't helpful because then they feel a lot of developers will feel that that's it opens them potentially to abuse by delays or if a project is unwanted in a town that, that it would be used as a, as a means of delaying it or, or disrupting the, the project. With a clear set of procedures that deal with not only how do we get to show compliance, do we enter into an agreement, how do we deal with this going forward during the life of the project, gives them a better system of communication, it gives you a better system of communication, and that makes a more effective working relationship because that's what this will be during the life of this project, a working relationship between the municipality and the developer to ensure that both sides are living up to their side of the agreement or meeting the standards of the law as it's set forth. Determining how to address road upgrades. That was touched on, okay? If they come in and they pave a road that was dirt or they widen it with shoulders and guardrails and things like that, what, once the, the need for that level of improvement is gone, what do you do with it? Do you accept it and leave it that way? Or do you plan ahead and say, well, once you're done with that and you tell us it's no longer needed, you take it out and restore it to its prior condition? We've worked with some municipalities where you know, a supervisor had stated, you know, if they take my dirt roads and they chip seal them or they pave them, I'm going to tell my residents, I'm going to let them deteriorate to nothing because we don't have the money to maintain those roads going forward for the next however many years. And the only way she could get that money is to raise taxes on her residents, which she didn't want to do. So it's a very reasonable thing. So the, the issue there was, well, let's not be in a position where you're letting a road deteriorate to nothing. You're creating a potential safety hazard and potential liability for the town. 
Let's have a vehicle to address that issue to make sure the roads are left in a condition that the town wants after the development activities occurred. And then lastly, determine whether your pro you want your program to address surface conditions of the roads or something more. One of the things that uh, engineering programs, particularly Delta's program, is very good at is looking at the roads and determining even if you're maintaining the surface of the road in a passable way, what is the impact of this traffic on the longevity or the planned life of the road? Now, I'm not a traffic designer and I'm not an engineer, but I've worked with these guys long enough and in other engineers to kind of get a handle on the, on, the, on the way this works. Roads are designed just like a car or refrigerator or anything else to last for a certain amount of time based on certain factors. Uh, what type of traffic it's going to have, the volume of traffic, the nature of the sub-base, and all the different physical dimensions that go into the construction of the road, then it's based on engineering standards. Our, if you do these ter types of things, it'll handle a certain amount of traffic for a certain amount of time, and then you'll have to replace the road. Um, so given those engineering standards, if you, imp if you make your decisions on how you're going to build the road, and then a new type of traffic comes in on top of that and it can drastically shorten the life of that road. So something you thought you might not have to address for 20 or 25 years may need to be addressed in five years. So that's a significant cost that you weren't anticipating and you wanna be able to deal with that. So it's not, you know, some towns are happy to look at the surface of the roads and make sure that they're okay and it is what it is and maybe there's a low, you know, but it's, it doesn't mean you're gonna necessarily have them dig up five miles of road and build a whole new road. It might be an evaluation of areas where damage has occurred in great, that's greater than others or meets a, a certain threshold, and then you know, they're, they're addressing that damage or paying money to allow the town to address that damage um, in or, you know, that occurs so that the town's road is truly in its condition before the, the project started. Yes, sir. So, so far your assumptions have been you have one developer Mm -hmm. But uh, the possibility exists that you could actually have two. Or more. We have a situation, or more. We have a situation in our town where we have a s state prison mm -hmm. that gets quite a bit of traffic, and whenever they rebuild it or do some work, mm -hmm. they can, our town road takes a real beating. But mm -hmm. there could be another project going on at the same time sure. where either project doesn't require a road rebuild, but together they really can't handle it. And so how, does, how's, how do we deal with that? Is well, that part of your consideration? Right. That, that is definitely a consideration. And what we try to do is take into account, again, as we said in the beginning, the purpose of this is not to get a town a new road. It's not to get a town a gold-plated road. It's not to do any of those things. It's to make sure that there's a fair distribution of the costs associated with the activity that's occurring. So basically, by having a program in place with a local law that creates standards and requirements that everybody using the road that creates a certain type of traffic has to follow, those costs can be prorated over to different developers. It requires a municipality to be diligent and keeping an eye on what's going on and understanding what's coming through its town. But really, that's really what you want to try to do. And, and these local laws that we've been working with have provisions in them to make sure that you know the first developer isn't shouldering all the costs, because that's not fair, and then they're going to complain. And, and nor is it that the first one gets a free ride and the second one then bears all the costs. So it's really an effort of, being, of making sure that you have the ability to prorate those damages. And the issue you're talking about is, well, there's a little bit of damage here and a little bit of damage here. You put it together, it's more. Well, really what you're looking at from an engineering standpoint is, given the, the regulated traffic on this road, what needs to happen to the road? Once that improvement or is identified, if any improvement is needed, then those costs are prorated. So rather than saying, well, you're re responsible for this length of road and you're responsible, you know, it's really more of, okay, you guys were regulated, we have agreements in place where you're subject to the law, and you're now finishing your project, and we look at it, and guess what? The road, this length of road needs to be replaced or repaired, you know, the sub-base needs to be dug out and replaced, and that's going to cost X amount of dollars, and because you used it for six months and you used it for three months, we're going to apportion the, the damages accordingly. Or you could do it by, based on you had X number of truck trips, you had Y number of truck trips and we apportion it accordingly. So that's an important issue that you don't want to saddle one particular person with damages for others. Yes, sir. In the example of uh, 
of a mall or something, mm -hmm. you're trying to get money out of the mall developer to cover the shortening of the life of the road during the construction period, and then is the assumption that the mall will provide enough property taxes to pay for the ongoing maintenance of the roads going forward? Well, yes. Basically what it is is there's a distinction between what's called baseline traffic and then concentrated traffic. And in that context, the concentrated traffic are all the trucks coming in to build the mall because it's not something that would normally occur whether the mall's there or not. Once the mall's up and operational, the roads theoretically should be in a condition to handle the traffic that that use is going to generate. Okay, so that, you know, once, you, so the theory is by taking the road after the construction period and we're putting it in a condition where it's fully repaired and suitable for the traffic, there's two elements. It's not just putting it back the way it was because now you have a traffic generator that was no, wasn't there before. So that has to be in, taken into account. So you repair the damage and you establish that it's sufficient for the traffic flow that's going to occur. So those two elements get taken care of and normally a building permit wouldn't be issued until the town is satisfied that the, that has occurred. And usually they have their engineers or experts that are telling them that, that it occurs. So then you're in a position where, okay, now the roads as they exist will handle this baseline traffic and that road as it is currently exists has a design life of five, 10, 15, 20 years. And given the traffic that we anticipate being on it, it will last that long. So you've now, that, that's how you try to make your, it's not just making it whole, it's making it suitable for the new condition. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, road preservation can be, programs can be supported by engineering or other means. The programs that are supported by engineering, I think are, are the most valuable. Um, you're looking at creating fair and objective standards that re relating to your roads that developers and other people are gonna to have to follow and meet in order to be compliant. You're creating an objective ap approach that gives you ability to accurately identify what appropriate escrow or bonding amounts will be. You can give you the ability, as we were just, just discussing, to discriminate between a developer's traffic and baseline traffic. So the developer's not paying for a historical problem, per se. They're paying for their, their fair share of the damage that's caused. Or also, you're looking at, as we discussed, between one developer and another heavy developer or heavy user's traffic. So you're looking at making sure you're fairly apportioning the damages to each party and that you're also making sure that you have the ability to look at what the true damages are. And then also you have a, an engineering basis to det determine what appropriate upgrades are. Now, the, uh, the, a lot of times when we were dealing with wind projects, the main means of identifying the conditions of the roads and improvements to be needed were photographs and videotape of, con of structures and roads, and then basically saying, well, yeah, we think this one's not good enough, and we maybe need to replace that culvert, or this bridge is an issue, maybe we'll go around it. But you, those photographs are focused on the, the surface condition of the road. It doesn't get to what's underneath the road and whether that's suitable. And, and a lot of times, the developers were even caught unawares because they would see the condition of the road and it looked like it's a paved road, but maybe the base of that road is dirt. It wasn't a gravel base and wasn't de developed to handle that kind of traffic. So they see a paved road and all of a sudden it falls apart in the first week. And now they have to go in and do all kinds of different repairs to bring that road up to handle the traffic. You know, a, a pure video or photographic assessment isn't gonna give you that uh, level of information. So using different engineering techniques with core sampling and even people have been looking at ground penetrating radar to look at what's underneath the road so we understand what we're dealing with is a really important piece and it makes your program that much more effective. Again, we talked a little about the video, the vis visual side. One issue is, you know, depending on the nature of the programs and the, or the developers that you're going to see, it can be a little more easy to administer. It can be quicker and, you know, it does create a, a documented basis of records. However, again, it, it's limited to the surface. It doesn't address the full scope. So if the surface is repaired, but it's not functioning the way it's supposed to, what do you do then? How do you, how do you prove that that condition is different due to the use that the developers have? What's in a good road use agreement? 
basically what, what you want to do and what we've recommended is developers are going to come in and say, these are the roads we want to use. And rather than say, you can use these specific roads and have a fight over what roads it's going to be, you look at it and say, okay, fine. You identify to us what your traffic is, what your haul routes are, and then we can go through and make an evaluation with our experts of what are the factors that make that a good haul route or not. And then may suggest potential problems or recommendations of upgrades that need to occur because of that. The developer can then undertake those upgrades or try an alternate route that might avoid the need for those upgrades to occur. Um, reasonable and specific mitigation measures are really important. You want to have a, the ability to understand what your road was, what's being done, what are the factors you're going to look at, and when they sign a road use agreement or come into compliance with your law, they're accepting those particular standards. So they can't say at the end of the day, well, we look at the video, we repaved four miles of road here, it looks fine. And we say, well, that's not the only standard, it's right here in the law, or it's right here in your agreement, and it lays out the different issues we're going to look at. And yes, the surface is fine, but there's all these culverts that were crushed or are about to be crushed because of the use that you had, and they need to be fixed. So those are different things that you can, you can look at. Um, you want to make sure proper insurance and even indemnities are provided. It's a very important piece. There's, you know, not just for the damage to your roads, but to the public and ongoing traffic. If someone's driving on the road and there's an accident with a vehicle as associated with the development and they're a regulated entity, nine times out of ten, you could be looking at being named as, as a town in a lawsuit because someone was damaged on, or injured on your roads or the, subject to a regulated activity. And you want to make sure that, hey, if anything happens, none of this would have occurred but for your activity, Mr. Developer, so you're going to cover any costs or exposure that I have. And you want to make sure the insurance requirements are correct. You're going to want to make sure that you're named as an additional insured and that the policies and all of that, it's a very detailed analysis to make sure you're truly covered under that policy is, is in place and that there's indemnity to defend you so you're not spending money to, with legal costs to defend yourself in a lawsuit that's only brought as a result of their activity. And also, one of the things we found is very important is contact information for all parties. One of the things that causes big problems with your public and with between the developer and the municipality is, who do I talk to? You know, the people that come present the project to you or discuss the permit with you or the agreement with you aren't going to be the people that are out on the road. So who do I talk to if I have a problem or there's damage? Who do I call? Where, what are, do you have regular meetings that, where you tell us where you're going to be working for the next two weeks? and what roads you're going to be concentrating on so we can advise our public of what they need to do. You know, be aware, there's going to be a lot of traffic over here. You might want to try a different route. So those are all very important things, and that only happens with good communication. And your goal is to make sure your roads are passable, safe, and you're not bearing the cost. And the best way to do that is to avoid getting over fights over what's going to happen and making sure the work is getting done. And that's all. We're, we're just about time for questions, I see. So I'm happy to take any questions you have and go from there. Yes, sir. Uh, part of this uh, presentation, the, the term voluntary road use agreement yep. 